Hello and welcome to the pier. Welcome to our service for the week of June 4th. So glad to be together like this. Just prior to this, you saw some slides talking about things that are going on in our community, ways you can get connected, ways that you can support us. Feel free to contact us at info at the peer.church if you have any questions about any of those things. And if you're new, an extra special welcome to you. My name is Jason, and I'm the lead pastor at the pier. And we would love to hear from you. There's a link in the description if you'd like to send us a connect card. That way we can be in touch. Now, I'm going to move into our sermon in just a moment, our message from our series on discipleship, on getting back to basics and discipling the next generation. But just before we do, I'd love to pray together. And I invite you, if you would like, to pause the video right now to take a moment, maybe take some deep breaths, and take a moment to center your thoughts on Jesus. As we remind ourselves, he's with us, the Spirit is with us, even as we're praying. So, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for the words you've been speaking in our lives already today, and we pray that you continue to speak Holy Spirit, that you'd move in us, that you would help us to discover what it is you want us to through this message coming up. And we just give this all to you, Lord Jesus. Teach us about the importance of sharing your love. Teach us about the importance of discipling, teaching others in your ways, and especially coming around, reaching out to the younger generations. So it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's jump into it. We're in the middle of a series called Back to Basics, Discipleship and the Next Generation. And it's all about really demystifying what discipleship is, what disciple making is, and especially for the purpose of talking about how can we disciple the next generation? How can we come alongside the next generation to teach the ways of Jesus, helping them to grow and develop in their own relationship, their own walk with Jesus. And this week, we're talking about the how. How do we go about discipling the next generation? And it's kind of a tough question, actually. It's a little bit complicated because as we're going to see, we're in a unique scenario, at least unique for our time. Because it's no secret that Younger generations, they make up a very small percentage of our church communities. They take up very little space in our church buildings. So what we're going to talk about how is I think that that, um, raising disciples of the next generation poses a challenge. One where we need to change and adapt if we are going to take part in that mission that we're called to to make disciples of all nations and generations. And you know what? It's got me thinking about Blockbuster, actually. Why? Because, well, Blockbuster is a story of a business that failed to read the situation around them and failed to adapt, and they died because of it. I don't know about you, but when I think of Blockbuster, I get pretty nostalgic. I remember back, even young, I absolutely loved going, driving down to Blockbuster or the local video store and walking around looking for that movie for that night. I mean, the smell of popcorn was in the air. It's movie night. You're excited. Maybe you've got a friend along with you. You're walking around looking for that perfect movie for that night. By the way, you're hoping that it was in, right? You're hoping you didn't get to it and then see that dreaded little clip on that says it's already been rented. Well, I'm sure you can relate. Many of us loved Blockbuster, but they're not around anymore. Video stores aren't around. So what happened? Well, we've all heard of Netflix. Netflix happened. Technology changed. And actually, Blockbuster, they could have seen it coming. Netflix started actually by, it was created by someone who was tired of late fees. You know, those late fees we used to get for not returning videos. He's tired of it. So he started to develop a new system. And it started by, as many of us know, a mail, like a buy mail DVD subscription service, which as we know, evolved into a streaming service where you pay one monthly fee and you've got access to so many movies and on demand access, 
where you don't have to worry about whether they're in or out, rented or not, and there's no late fees. Well, Blockbuster could have seen this coming, but they didn't, as I said, and they failed to adapt. In fact, they decided not to change. They stuck to their model of having physical DVDs in a physical location. Maybe they tried to change things up just a little bit, you know, they tried to stock just tons of the important, like the, you know, the popular titles. And also they did the whole thing around late fees. I don't know if you remember that, where they got rid of late fees. That was like the big thing, no more late fees. But it didn't work. And they were completely out of business by 2014. And Netflix, as we know, has become the dominant way to watch movies, along with many others who have borrowed from their model. Now, probably the biggest issue here was the CEO's approach. He failed to understand. He failed to read what was going on and he failed to adapt. In fact, there's this famous or maybe infamous quote that really captures his mindset. He says this, and it's a quote that's now filled with quite a lot of irony. Neither Redbox nor Netflix, so Redbox was another company that was starting out something like Netflix. Neither Redbox nor Netflix are even on the radar screen in terms of competition. It's more Walmart and Apple. Failed to read it, failed to adapt, and his business died. Now, I'm not trying to, con I'm not trying to compare the church to a business. But what I see the parallel here is that we too need to pay attention to the situation around young, younger generations if we are going to disciple younger generations and we need to adapt to it. Now, the big idea then that I want to talk about is that we're in a situation where we won't be able to disciple younger generations if we don't adapt and change our approach. And it's not that we need to throw it all out, all that we've been doing. No, what we talked about last week still stands. I think that is timeless in terms of how our part and our response to God's role, our community's role in our discipleship development. But what we need to change is kind of at the nuts and bolts level and how we frame it all. And I think we have to keep this in mind, that successful discipleship of the next generation will require very intentional discipleship of the next generation. It's going to take a commitment to being disciple-making communities that are accessible to younger generations, that are open, that there is a clear path to community, to church. And thankfully, I believe that we can learn how to approach this, what to do, the principles from the early church. Because I, as we're going to talk about, I think they were in a parallel situation. We're going to draw some principles from then. So that's what we're talking about today. And what I would like to do to start out is look at the state of things. Just bring us all up to speed so we can understand kind of what's going on. And we're talking about different generations. So let's just talk about that quickly. On the screen, you see there's, there's for our purposes, there's six different like labels for different generations. You've got the silent generation who are currently 95 to 78 years old. You've got baby boomers who are currently 77 to 59 years old. Then Gen X, Generation X, who are currently 58 to 44. We're getting closer to my age. Then there's millennials who are currently 43 to 29. And then Gen Z, who are currently 28 years old, all the way to nine years old. And then the newest one, which my kids are in, Gen Alpha, who are currently eight years old, all the way to one years old, or one year old, maybe zero, I guess you could say. And now, okay, so that's who we're talking about. And there's a really... Um, good site for information on something that we need to be up on. It's called Religion in Public. It's created by a group of scholars who are exploring the relationship between religion and public life. And they've been looking at data and commenting on data since 2008, which gives us a pretty good picture of kind of the trend in different generations toward like having no religious affiliation. In, term, in other words, it surveys how many people are Christian, 
how many people are atheist agnostic, how many people are from other religions. And what they've observed are the trends, kind of out of those into those. And what they've found is really important. They've observed a trend toward having no religious affiliation in all generations. But probably the most alarming one, for our, especially for our conversation, is that that trend is the most extreme in the younger generations. Now, what we mean by no religious affiliation is that they would say, someone would say that they're either atheist, agnostic, or it's just not a big deal. I'm not really, I don't even think about it. So, like I said, basically all generations, you see on the graph in front of us, basically all generations are, have been moving toward this from 2008 until 2022. And this is data from a Harvard University, um, from a Harvard University group. And so even the silent generation and baby boomers have moved a bit in this direction, but that's a minority statistic for them. For silent generation, it's a movement from 12 to 18 percent. And in the baby boomers, it's a movement from 17 to 26 percent. But notice how much things change starting at Gen Xers. It starts at a higher number and it's moving toward a larger group. So for Gen X, it starts at 25% and at, that was in 2008. Now 35% of Gen Xers have no religious affiliation. In millennials, it's higher. It moved, started at 33% and moved toward 44%. And then Gen Z started at 39% and are now at 44%. And that's all quite monumental if you think about it. As the, this website says, Gen Zs are the first generation in American history who have a higher percentage of nuns or people with no religious affiliation than they do Christians. And if the trend continues, very soon the amount of people with no religious affiliation in Gen Z and in millennials. It's gonna outnumber, it's gonna be the majority. It's gonna outnumber those who have any religious affiliation, especially those who are Christian. And my experience, I don't know about you, I'm sure your experience bears this out as well. Mine certainly has. In my experience with youth ministry and young adult ministry, it seemed to be the case. When I would ask people, what's it like sharing your faith with your friends? they would say, you know what? It doesn't really come up. It's not that really a big deal. It's not something we really think about. So you see, that's that, it's that slant at work. And what this means for us, I think, what this boils down to for our conversation about discipleship and discipling the next generation is that discipleship and mission have to go hand in hand. Because while there are some who have grown up in our churches who are part of younger generations, many are not. In fact, as we're seeing, the majority have not. And in fact, the majority maybe haven't even stepped foot in a church because they've grown up that way. As we see from Gen X who are their parents on. So that means they have no context for Jesus, for church life, anything like that. So discipleship it's going to need to start with evangelism now more than ever in our kind of recent history. And also, it's going to require very much a missional mindset where we need to be intentional about how are we going to communicate the gospel to people who don't know Christian, the Christian language, Christian symbols, don't know Jesus, any of that. We have to find ways to communicate the gospel in ways that are relatable, and in ways where we're meeting the next generation where they're at, as Danielle said at the very beginning of our series. And you know what? I think we find a pretty amazing parallel in the early church, in the book of Acts. So for the remainder of our time together, I want to talk about that enough that we kind of get it in our minds. And I want to draw three principles that we can use in our conversation in our approach, in our being intentional about discipling the next generation. So, okay, what's the situation? Well, the early church, I think, was in a very similar situation to us. It wasn't a next generation thing, 
but they were in a time where they were trying to learn to disciple people that had no context for what they were talking about. We've got to remember that the early church started as Jewish Christians. The apostles' disciples were Jewish. And so it came, what they were bringing with them was all their traditions, their worldview, the law, their scriptures, all of that was part of it. But the Spirit soon led the early church to reach out to Gentiles. The Spirit was working in the hearts of Gentiles, bringing Gentiles who are non-Jewish people, so Greek, Roman, others, bringing them into the church. And they had to adapt. They had to learn what it meant to disciple people who, from a completely different background. And that was, the, that was totally the case. I mean, this was a group. The Gentiles were a group, knew nothing of a Jewish Messiah, knew nothing about things like salvation from sin, because this was a group that was coming from a polytheistic context and from a Greco-Roman worldview, Greco-Roman political situation, what Greco-Roman values, all of that. Very foreign to what was started with kind of this, this Jewish movement. And so, as I said, the early church had to even quickly learn to adapt, to change, so they could be open to the Gentiles that the Spirit was bringing in and so that they could help them become disciples of Jesus. Does that sound familiar to you? The younger generations, I think, are kind of in a parallel sort of situation. They know very little. As we've seen from the stats, the majority, soon to be the majority anyways, knows very little about Jesus, knows very little about church life, about anything in, within our context. They're coming from a world where the majority of people, it's, they're not really thinking about God. There is no God. Or if there is, they're coming from a pluralistic worldview where all religions are equal. And when it comes also to their worldview and values, they're coming from this interesting, tough blend between modernism, which proclaims that you know, technology and science can lead us forward, and also a postmodernist approach to life, which says that all narratives all stories are equal because there's no grand narrative to things. In other words, you do you, I'll do me. I won't judge you, you don't judge me. Everyone live and let live, that sort of thing. So then, if we're in a parallel situation, I think we can learn from the early church, from what they did, so that we can apply that to our own situation. So what did they do? Well, first off, what we see is that they sent people who were called by the Spirit. They sent missionaries to the Gentiles. And so what, how this worked was they recognized people and commissioned them, equipped and commissioned people to be sent. Many of those, some of those were apostles. So Peter, we learn about his story in detail about how he was called to the Gentiles. We learn about Paul's story in detail as well. But we also know there was a, a, quite a few others who went to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. We read about that part in Acts 11. It says, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. That is an important step and lesson for us when we think about intentionality and discipling the next generation. Integrally, for us, discipling the next generation means mission. It means evangelism. It means that we need to be open and ready for people being called to be sent. And we need to equip and commission those who are called to be sent to campuses, to schools, or wherever else the Spirit might call them to reach out with the love of Jesus to the younger generations. So that's the first one. Another important thing that we see and learn is that the early church made the path, so to speak, into discipleship and into community as smooth as possible while remaining centered on Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. That's a powerful one. That's an important one. And here's the thing. It's a pretty interesting story because that did not happen automatically. 
But the early church recognized a need to change and adapt so they can remain open. You see, a big issue actually came up around the law. There was a group of people who were teaching Gentile, young Gentile believers, you know, who were just brand new to the faith. They were teaching them that you got to obey the law, the whole law, in order to follow Jesus. Can you imagine that? You're a new Christian and someone comes to you and gives you this big list of rules and regulations and says, you got to follow that if you're going to follow Jesus. And you're looking at the list and it's quite detailed, especially around what you can eat, what you can eat, what you can touch, what you can't touch. And then also for the guys, there was one in there, you're like, that looks really painful. I don't know if I signed up for that. I'm talking about the rule of circumcision. So this caused a lot of problems because Paul, the apostles, totally disagreed. That's not the way of Jesus. We don't need to create those kind of burdens for people. So it reached a big, almost like a climactic point here, and it went all the way to the top. It had to go to the Jerusalem council for them to make a decision on what was the truth here. What are we going to make in terms of like the, the rules for Gentiles here around the law. And what did, what did they decide? Well, they decided to change a whole bunch of things. They, in order to be open, they basically said, you don't have to follow the law. That law that they had been learning from and growing in and following themselves, even as followers of Jesus, many of the dietary rules and all that, up to this point, they decided that, no, we're not going to make Gentiles follow that. And in fact, they just boiled it down to four kind of rules. But basically, they were three of them anyways were rules that were designed just to follow these because we need you to be sensitive to Jewish Christians. And what's important is to see the rationale that they used in deciding those. We see it in what Peter says. He, when he's speaking to the council, he says, what are we doing, everybody? Why are we now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And James says, my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. From those, if you read more in, in the detail there too in Acts 15, Two things stand out. One, we need to change. We need to be willing to change so that it's not difficult for the next generation to be discipled and to join our communities. That's the first. The second, while remaining centered on Jesus. Right? I love how Peter, in terms of being centered on Jesus, Peter says, we, the undeserved grace, really it boils down to, right? salvation, the undeserved grace of Jesus. It boils down to Jesus. But they keep saying, we can't make it burdensome. They keep saying, we shouldn't make it difficult. So I think those two things should guide us as well. So that's really two questions, I think, for us to reflect on, really important ones. The first one, how can we remain open to to the younger generations? What do we need to change maybe in order to make the path to discipleship and into our communities a smooth one? One example that I've learned about has come from youth ministry. And actually what I found in youth ministry was that we need to make sure that there is a very gradual, purposeful kind of road to community and discipleship for the younger generation. What I mean by that was what kind of we found is that when it comes to youth ministry, people are at very different places when it comes to discipleship in Jesus. Some people, and this is like on a given Friday night, some people they've been in, invited by a friend, you know, youth night, I mean. One, some people they've been invited by a friend, they don't know Jesus. Other people, they're there because their parents made them. Other people, they're there because they kind of like it, they want to have fun, but that's about it. Other people are there because they're serious about discipleship in Jesus. And what we found was that one Friday night couldn't meet the needs of everyone. So 
we learned that it was important to have different times, different gatherings that were designed around different needs, depending on where people were at. So there was like a nice gradual road into community, into discipleship. Friday nights became, some of the Friday nights became much more about just having fun, getting together, sharing Jesus' love, being with other, you know, so that people had a chance just to be in that loving community, that Jesus community. Sunday mornings, that was an opportunity for those who are a little more purposeful, a little more interested to learn to go in deeper. And also we took advantage of other times together, like we had a youth band. So that was a group who was pretty serious about their faith. So we use, utilized the fact that we had the shared interest in music to help disciple. So that's what I mean. That's something that I've learned in youth ministry. And that's what I mean by creating a nice, gradual, smooth road for people. And that Jesus-centered part, it's so crucial as well. Like, we have to make sure we're not discipling people in things that are secondary to Jesus. And that's what I've learned. It's important to be Jesus-first, Jesus-centered, and not disciple people in kind of the rules, maybe, or those sorts of things that I think are important. And Jesus might be saying, no, those rules actually aren't coming from me, as it was the case with the early church example, or he might be saying, look, they aren't even ready for that yet. Just show them me. Show them my love. So that's the second one. I want to take a bit more time with that because I thought it was really important. The third thing that we learn from the early church is that they approach discipleship with humility and teachability. You know what? We see this with Peter, actually. The changes the early church experienced were tough for everyone, including Peter. The only way he kind of made it through was because he remained open to the Spirit and humble and teachable to the Spirit and even to the people that he was reaching out to. Because there was this one situation where Peter was called to go to a Gentile home, to go to Cornelius' home, who was a Roman centurion. And at first, Peter thought, I can't do that. I'm a Jewish person under these laws, and so I can't be in that close contact with Gentiles. I can't eat their food. And also, he wasn't sure, like, will they really have the Holy Spirit? I've never experienced this before. So what had to happen, the Spirit had to teach him, had to give him a vision saying, it's okay, you can eat what they eat, took a major vision. And also, it took him seeing the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. They were speaking in other tongues by the Spirit. And that showed him, oh my goodness, they've got the Spirit too. Let's baptize them. Let's start them on the discipleship journey. His response when he's talking to the other apostles about it is amazing. He said what he learned is God gave them, these Gentiles, the same gift he gave him and the other disciples and apostles when they first believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, then, who was I to stand in God's way? I love that. So, he was teachable, he was humble. Teachable and humble to what the Spirit was doing. And also, he was teachable, he learned from the people he was reaching out to. He learned from Cornelius and his household. He learned from talking to them, from hearing from them, hearing them describe what was going on, seeing the Spirit at work in them. He realized that, yeah, we need to expand our thinking here. And he learned how to help them more deeply. So he approached his relationships with that teachability as well, a desire to learn. So then for us, the third thing we can learn is that we need to approach discipling the generation in the same way, with humility and teachability, being willing to let the Spirit do the guiding and with a desire to learn from one another. Not just to go in here, I'm going to teach you, but to learn from one another. And again, I can speak from my experience in youth ministry on this one in a major way, and especially when it comes to how to minister and how to do outreach. And here's the thing, it wasn't easy. I had to be vulnerable and teachable. I went for a time where I was like, I know what I'm doing, and I just kind of went for it, and it didn't work. So I started opening myself up. And I can remember one coffee in particular. I took a couple teens out for coffee, and I asked them, how are you finding 
Fridays. And I made sure they knew, I want you to be honest. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. Well, it kind of stung <laughs> because what I heard back was, you know what, Jason, when you're teaching us, it's kind of boring. It kind of feels like you're just talking to adults. And also they said, you know, like the pictures that you put up on the screen, they're not very good. <laughs> and that taught me, like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really even value the pictures in that. I was just kind of doing it. I realized, wow, they find that really important. I got to get better at that. And also when it came to worship, I learned, they said, you know what? We kind of don't mind worship. We're at that space, but we would never invite our friends to this. It would just be too weird for them. So simply just talking, listening, I learned so much about ministry and, sorry, young adult ministry and youth ministry just by talking, seeing what the Spirit was up to, hearing from them, hearing their needs. And by the way, another very powerful way to go about this is to make sure that we empower young leaders to sometimes even lead the charge in all of this, but definitely to partner with us as we are kind of on this mission to disciple younger generations. Okay, so I want to finish there. And we've been talking about this idea that successful discipleship of the next generation will require intentional discipleship, very intentional discipleship of the next generation. And we've been looking to the early church, their situation, a parallel situation, to learn how we can approach this. And we saw that there was three maybe principles that we learned. We learned that it's important to be missional about this, to send people on mission to the next generation. We also learned the importance of making the path into discipleship and community a smooth one, one that isn't difficult while still remaining centered on Jesus and remaining sensitive to members within our family. And lastly, we talked about the importance of approaching situations, approaching all this with an openness, a humility, a teachability toward the Spirit, and also toward one another, to be willing to learn from one another. So next week, we're going to dig even deeper into how we all are part of this when it comes to discipling the next generation. We're going to get into some more of the nuts and bolts. But in the meantime, I think this is so important. I hope you're sensing how important this is. And it takes all of us. So I would invite you to reflect on this question through this coming week. Ask yourself and ask God, how might God be calling me to do my part in discipling the next generation? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your love for all generations, your desire for all everyone to be in relationship with you, Jesus, to receive your life, to receive your salvation. We thank you that we're, as a church community, the peer church, that we are called into your mission to make disciples of all nations and generations. And I thank you for what we've learned today about these principles that we glean from the early church. I pray that you'd reinforce them now. The Holy Spirit, you'd speak them into us. Help us to find practical ways to live them out. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd speak to each of us as we ask that question. What's my role in this? How can I invest in the next generation? How is God, how are you calling me? How are you calling us to disciple the next generation? We, we pray, Spirit, that you'd speak loud and clear and that we'd be open to your guidance. Yeah, so it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got any questions, if you'd like to talk about this further, I invite you to contact us. You can contact us through the link in the description below by filling out a connect card. You can email us at info at the peer .church. We would love to hear from you. But until next time, God bless.